Thank you for joining us today for Earth Echo STEM Explore virtual field trip, Water, Water Everywhere and Not a Drop to Drink, featuring Dr. Jamie DeWitt from East Carolina University in Greenville, North Carolina. Hello everyone, my name is Casey Gaylord Opaleski and I'm the STEM Explore coordinator at Earth Echo International. We're so excited to have students from all over the globe joining us as we learn about STEM careers. This live event is part of STEM Explore, Earth Echo's newest program that is taking inspiration to access by telling the stories of dynamic women in STEM careers during live virtual field trips. We are excited to bring STEM Explore to life thanks to support from our presenting sponsor, United Technologies. You can explore a number of STEM careers as well as tune in for upcoming live events like this one at Earth Echo's STEM Explore website, stemexplore.org. I'd like to recognize and thank STEM Explore's five partner sites across the country and recognize those that are joining us today. First, let's get a hello from our friends at DH Conley in Greenville, North Carolina. So, DH Conley, how is everyone doing today? Good. 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 Wonderful to see you all out there. Thank you for joining us. Now, let's head over to Wilson, North Carolina to the spot. Hello, how is everyone at the spot doing today? Good. Wonderful, great to have everyone join us. And both of these interactive classrooms are with our partners at Love Us Sea Turtle. So we're very excited to have them join us this afternoon. Now, we also want participation from all of you out there that are tuning in live. So you can participate and ask questions of our STEM Explore mentor, Dr. DeWitt, if you're watching on one of our live streams, either on YouTube or on stemexplore.org. So if you're watching on YouTube, it's pretty simple. Just use the chat space just to the right of your viewing window, or it might be below that viewer. If you're watching directly on EarthEchoStemExplore.org website, you'll simply click the link at the top of the viewing window that says Submit Questions. Now, I do want to apologize. We have a little glitch with our website, and it says Submit Questions to Sierra Pullman. We've already talked to Sierra Pullman back in October, and we are talking to Dr. Jamie DeWitt today. But that link will definitely get you to our Google form where we can monitor your questions. So we definitely want to hear from you out there, the viewing audience that are participating. So you can please go ahead and post questions now or at any time during this live event and we will get those. And we'll be answering questions throughout the event. So we've set aside a lot of time for your questions and for your answers from Dr. DeWitt. So let's get started. I would like to welcome our special guest today for Earth Echo STEM Explorer virtual field trip, Dr. Jamie DeWitt. So Dr. DeWitt, how are you doing today? Hello, I'm glad that it's almost Thanksgiving break. Yes, it is. I think everybody is ready for a little bit of a fall break here in the state, so we're pretty excited about that. So Dr. DeWitt, can you tell us where are you coming to us live from? I am in my office at the Brody School of Medicine of East Carolina University here in Greenville, North Carolina. Awesome. We're so excited to have you here today, Dr. DeWitt. So to get everything started, why don't we just go ahead and let you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background. Absolutely. So I'm an environmental toxicologist. And when I was an undergraduate at Michigan State University, I really didn't know anything about toxicology. In fact, I didn't really learn much about it until after I had already graduated. I started off as a, a young, child wanting to be a veterinarian. I was one of those little girls who loved horses. I had the opportunity to work on a horse farm starting when I was 12. I worked there from when I was 12 until I was 16 and I thought that I wanted to be a veterinarian and take care of horses and cows and other large animals. When I decided to go to college, I chose Michigan State University because they have a vet school and I thought, well, if I go to an undergraduate institution where there's a vet school, it'll be really easy for me to go to vet school. The problem is, is that nobody in my family had gone to college at that point, so we didn't really know anything about preparing yourself for college. When I applied to college, I did all my own essays, I did all my own financial aid forms, and really went in having a lot of 
lack of understanding about what it would take to become a veterinarian. So when I started college, I was really not prepared. And to be perfectly honest, I didn't do very well in my first year of college. It's really hard to get your grade point average up when you start off fairly low starting college. But fortunately, I had a really awesome job at the Michigan State University Museum. I worked in mammalogy, and one of my jobs was to write numbers on bones and to take dead animals and turn them into skeletons or into study skins. And I got to work with a bunch of flesh-eating bugs because they clean flesh from bones to help us make skeletons. And by working at this job, I learned a little bit about zoology and learned about fish and wildlife and learned about a lot of other fields of science that I didn't really know about when I was thinking I wanted to be a veterinarian. Well, at one point, I lost my financial aid because I made too much money working the two jobs I worked every summer and had to get a different job. And I started working in a lab where ticks were evaluated. And these ticks were evaluated for Lyme disease. So I spent a lot of time dissecting ticks. I also was lucky enough to get another job in landscape entomology, where I went to golf courses and forests and learned all about pesticides. So I started learning about these pesticides and wondering why we needed to use all these harmful chemicals to kill insects that provided a fairly important role in the ecosystem, even though they could carry diseases. After I finished with my undergraduate degree at Michigan State, I had absolutely no idea what to do. So I started working in our health and safety office. I was able to inspect laboratories for chemical safety. And through my job at this Office of Radiation, Chemical, and Biological Safety, I learned about the world of toxicology and learned that toxicology is the most perfect science in the world. Toxicology blends biology, chemistry, math, environmental science, and all sorts of other different fields such as politics, economics, law, regulation. And I decided, you know what? I think that this toxicology area is probably the right field for me. I really enjoyed backpacking throughout most of my college career. I enjoyed learning about nature, but I also loved working in a laboratory. I loved dissecting ticks, even though that's kind of gross. I also loved making skeletons. So I thought toxicology would be the best way for me to put all of my scientific training uh, into one big field. And what I do now as a toxicologist is I study how environmental pollutants, mostly those found in the water, affect health. I look predominantly at the immune system, but I also look at the nervous system, and I also look at how the immune system and the nervous systems develop. So I actually went to Indiana University and got a PhD in environmental science. I was studying how chemicals known as polychlorinated biphenyls affect brain development. I had some neuroscientists on my committee and they said, well, Jamie, you know, you're only a few credits away from a second PhD in the neurosciences. So I said, so I would get a second PhD. And they said, yeah, you're only seven credits away. So I have a second PhD in neuroscience and then I did training after I got my PhD at the United States Environmental Protection Agency in combination with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill to learn about the immune system. So now that's why I study both the immune system and the nervous system. And in my opinion, toxicology is still the perfect science. <laughs> Wow, that is quite a background, Jamie. I'm really hoping we have a lot of questions that <laughs> everybody tuning in is thinking about because dissecting ticks, putting skeletons together, that is a pretty amazing background to have. So you mentioned, of course, that you are in toxicology now. So can you tell us a little bit more about the field of toxicology? Absolutely, absolutely. So toxicology is classically defined as the effects of poisons on living organisms, but not everything we study is a poison. Most of the things that I study are compounds that are synthesized or made by humans. They go into our computers, they go into our carpeting, sometimes they go into the nice backpacking clothes that we wear, sometimes they go into our makeup, sometimes they even go into our bodies to try to make us a little bit better. So chemicals are all around us, Sometimes they are beneficial, but sometimes they're not beneficial. And so what I try to understand is how they are not beneficial. So I study the effects of pollution, and I mostly look at the types of pollution that we drink with our drinking water. So if you look at the figure that's on the screen right now, you can see there's lots of different sources of pollutants into the environment, 
Sometimes they get into the environment because industries produce them. Sometimes they get into the environment because we have to use them to control pests on our food crops. Sometimes they get into the environment because we flush them down the toilet and we really shouldn't. But what happens when they're in the environment is that they often come back into our bodies where we can breathe them, eat them, drink them, or even absorb them through our skin. So I try to understand what happens when these compounds get into our bodies. Is it a bad thing or is it not such a bad thing? And I try to understand so that the people who protect our health, such as the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Health and Human Services here in North Carolina, can make sure that we're not gonna get sick or develop a disease from our exposure to these pollutants. Awesome, thank you so much. So to kind of get into the nitty gritty of what it, exactly it is that you do, do you just wanna dive right in? Sure, sure, I will dive right into water pollution. Nice pun there. <laughs> I've, I've always really been interested in the aquatic ecosystem. In fact, I have a bracelet that has a, a, an insect case on it, if you can see it there. That is a caddisfly larval case or a pupil case. It's called Trichoptera, and there's actually a very nice woman who, who makes them, and I purchase them from her every year. But I've always been interested in the aquatic environment because water is something that we need. We all need fresh water. We all need clean water. And most of us who've grown up in the United States go to our tap, fill a glass of water, and drink it, and just assume that our water is safe to drink. But what I've learned over my, my years of being a toxicologist, and I got my PhD in 2004, so I've been doing this for a little while, what I've learned is that there's a lot of chemicals in our water, and some of them aren't regulated by any agency that's designed to protect our health. And so water pollution exists for a variety of reasons, but you've probably learned that there are two main sources of water pollution. There are point sources or non-point sources. Point sources are those sources that you can see spewing right into the water. You might see a sewage pipe or a drainage pipe or a fancy word for that is an effluent pipe flowing right into the water. Sometimes these are allowable discharges. In other words, sometimes a company has a permit so that they can spew that pollution out into the water and that's allowed by some of our government agencies. Sometimes though pollutants get into the water just by flowing off of the land. They might flow off of a field that's been oversprayed with a pesticide. It might flow down a road because we've paved a lot of our natural areas over. Ultimately, a lot of the pollutants that end up in the water come from the land. Sometimes they come from the air. That's another source of an indirect discharge. And so I really work with these contaminants that are called unregulated. Sometimes we call them emerging. We don't have a lot of information about what they do to our bodies. And so they're not currently regulated, which to me is kind of a little bit scary that we're drinking water that has chemicals in it for which we have very little information. And it's, it's really because of the complex way that our chemicals are regulated and it's much too detailed to go into here, but it tells us that maybe we might have uh, some interest in, in voting someday for individuals who might help to protect our water and our air through, through helping to enable some of our protection laws. Uh, so water pollution is what I study and I'm interested in it because we all have a right to have clean water, including the, the animals that live in the water. Excellent. So can you explain a little bit more about <clears throat> how would pollution, say, get into that drinking water a little bit further? Right. So I mentioned sometimes that when we take medicines, we might flush them down the toilet. Sometimes we do that when we're trying to dispose of medicines. You should never dispose of your medicines by flushing them down the toilet. There are actually organizations that will take those medications for you and properly dispose of them. They're often called Operation Medicine Chest here in North Carolina. But let's say I drank some coffee this morning and because I've consumed coffee, I went to the bathroom several times. That coffee has caffeine in it, so the caffeine that I drank got peed out when I went to the bathroom. So when I went to the bathroom, my water ultimately went to the utility plant. And here in North Carolina or here in Greenville, we have a utility company called Greenville Utilities that does a really good job of cleaning materials out of our water. So a lot of the bigger stuff that we might flush down the toilet gets cleaned out, but the smaller things like these organic materials such as caffeine or maybe the lotion that I put on my, my hands earlier today, 
those don't have any regulations and they're often not cleaned out of water. So the contaminants that I consumed or the chemicals that I consumed are now into the water that we use for, an, for enjoyment, such as kayaking or canoeing. That water then comes back in through a different treatment system and it's often, those compounds often are not cleaned out. Again, they're not regulated. And a lot of these utilities don't have the technology to clean out these little organic compounds. So that when we put that water into our glass, some of these compounds then get into the glass and we drink them again. This can be a problem, especially for very young children who don't have systems that are really well developed. So babies, for example, you know how they're all spastic and wiggling around, they can't talk, their eyes don't focus. That means that they haven't finished developing. And so those babies that haven't finished developing end up being more sensitive to these types of chemicals. So when we talk about water pollution, those very young people are especially, uh, especially susceptible or vulnerable. So often much of our regulations are designed to protect those developing organisms, such as children and babies. And then Dr. DeWitt, can you tell us a little bit more about how would those chemicals say get into something that we're using to the products that we use every day. All right, so if you look at the slide that's on right now, on the right hand side is a picture of a whole bunch of different products that we probably have in our homes. Some of us might like to wear lipstick. I have three cats and a dog. They tend to throw up a lot, so I use a lot of carpet cleaners to clean up their vomit. Some of us might like to eat microwave popcorn. Some of us might even have furniture that has a really nice non-stick coating on it so that when you spill your chocolate milk on it, you can just wipe it right up and not get in trouble for staining the couch. So these compounds get put into these products because they have specific uses. For example, that, that couch with the non-stick coating is a convenience product. That non-stick coating makes that couch last a little bit longer, makes it easier to clean up so you don't use as many cleaning products. But the chemicals that make that couch non-stick are the chemicals that I study. And if you look at the chart on the left-hand side of the screen, or at least on the left-hand side of my screen, the big chart, these chemicals are called PER and polyfluoro alkyl substances, or PFAS. This is a big group of chemicals. We think that there are over 5,000 individual chemicals in this group. They're all human made, so they've all been synthesized in a lab. They're all produced by industries. And these are put into these different products because they have benefits. But there are also costs to using these types of chemicals. They end up in the environment. So when we make carpeting with nonstick coating, some of these PFASs end up in the water, either through discharges that the companies have permits for, or they end up in the water just because somebody's spraying the floor and it goes into the sewer system. Sometimes these PFASs get back into the water because they end up in the waste stream. So they end up as solid waste in the wastewater treatment plants. Those solids can sometimes get sprayed onto fields that's another way for PFAS is to get back into the water. So that's that non-point source from land into water. So really, it, the, the summary is that these chemicals that are very complicated that we use in our everyday products can get into our water through a lot of different sources. They're considered emerging compounds. They're not regulated. So a lot of scientists are working together to help to understand how they get into the water, how much of them get into the water, where they go when they're in the water, and how they get into our bodies. So I'm part of the group of scientists that are trying to understand what these chemicals do to us once they get into our bodies. Wow, that is incredible. So before we go to questions from our interactive sites, I want to see can can you tell us or show us rather how you were to how you would study these P, PFAS? Is that what PFASes. you said? Yep. PFAS. How would you study those in the lab? Well, as I mentioned, one of the things that we do in my laboratory is to look at how these chemicals affect the immune system. And remember, the immune system is what keeps you from getting sick. It's what's it's the part of your body that protects you from bacteria and viruses and other little germs that might get into our bodies. And so we want our immune systems to work really well, especially this time of the year because we're traveling a lot, we're seeing a lot of family, and we want to make sure that we're healthy when we're visiting family. So we look at how these chemicals negatively impact the immune system. 
And so one of the ways that we do that is by looking at how the immune system functions. And what you're seeing now is a video of my lab. There I am, where, where we just on Friday, we were doing an assay to try, or a test or an experiment to try to understand how these chemicals affected the immune system. And what we're doing here in the lab is grinding up a whole bunch of tissue so that we can mark each individual cell in the tissue with a little label that sticks to the surface of the cell so that we can zap a laser beam at it and tell exactly what kind of a cell it is. So we're looking for cells of the immune system that are known as T cells, B cells, and natural killer cells. So this is just a shot of my laboratory so that you can see what my laboratory at the Brody School of Medicine looks like. All sorts of equipment and all sorts of people moving around. I also wanna point out that most of the people in my lab right now are females, but on this particular day, it was it was male heavy. My, my females were, were not in the lab that particular day. So we did all of this procedure to try to look at these little B cells, T cells, and natural killer cells. What you're seeing here now, the student Mark, he's an undergraduate student who's studying neuroscience. We have a tube of these cells, but before we can label them with those little labels that will change color when the laser beams zap them, we have to count the cells. So he's taking cells that we've mixed with these special dyes, putting them onto a special slide so that he can count the cells. Actually, an instrument will count the cells for us, which is really cool. Back in the olden days, you would have to put the cells on a slide and look at the microscope and then count all the cells by hand. This instrument right there, it will count the cells for you automatically and it will tell you how much you need to adjust the number of cells so that they're all exactly the same number. So we had 26 different samples and every single one of those 26 samples had to be the same number of cells in each sample. So this last video is, this is the machine that's called a flow cytometer. This is the machine that's filled with laser beams. And those laser beams hit the cells as they go through this little tube. So the cells go through a little tube one at a time. The laser beam hits them. And depending on what marker they have, different colors will come off. So you might see on the computer there, red colors, blue colors, and green colors. And those all represent different kinds of cells. So we get to use laser beams to zap cells. So I've got to tell you, cool Dr. Stuff. DeWitt, I'm pretty impressed that you're not using a microscope to count those cells. No, this, this little instrument we have does it automatically. We put in two kinds of dyes. One type of dye labels, labels live cells. The other type of dye labels dead cells. And so it just takes a bunch of pictures and then counts all the cells and gives us a total cell count, which is such a time saver. I yeah. do have to point out, though, that those little slides we use cost $2.50 each. So it's, it's expensive, but it does save time. Wow, pretty amazing. So once you are finished counting or doing your experiment or your assay, what happens next? What does some of that data look like? So the slide that you have now is an example of some of the data that we produce from these experiments. That chart with all those numbers in it are different numbers of different cells that we've collected from different tissues that receive different levels of exposure of one of these PFASs called perfluorooctanoic acid. Actually, this one is actually an aqueous film forming foam, which is a mixture of PFASs, but that's very complicated. So it tells us if we've exposed the tissues to different concentrations of these chemicals, does the number of cells change? So we wanna make sure that we're not killing cells. And then the graph tells us what's happening in terms of function of the immune system. So most of us, most of us this time of the year go and get a flu shot. And so that's a vaccine. Our body makes antibodies against the flu shot. Well, we can do the same thing in our experiments. We can give the immune system something like a flu shot and then ask, does it make the right amount of antibody? And so the graph shows us that with PFOA, this perfluorooctanoic acid chemical, the ability of the body to make antibodies decreases with an increase in PFOA concentration. So in other words, 
the higher amount of PFOA that you give, the lower the amount of antibody produced. And so that means that the immune system isn't doing what it should be doing. And this is directly applicable or it trans, it, it's directly transferable to the human condition. So we have some studies from these chemicals that also show when humans get vaccinated, they don't develop the vaccine response that they should develop to be protected from what the vaccine is supposed to protect them against. Great. So how exactly, so I know that you're doing all of your work in North Carolina right now. So can you talk a little bit about those PFASs in the water pollution in North Carolina? Yes. So about a year ago, well, actually about two years ago, a scientific paper came out in a very highly rated scientific journal, and it reported on different types of PFASs found in the Cape Fear River here in North Carolina, near, near Wilmington and downstream from Fayetteville. And this paper reported that there are really high levels of a specific PFAS called Gen X. Don't you just love all these fancy chemical names? Well, about a year after the scientific publication came out, a, a reporter by the name of Von Haggerty was, did a little bit more research and found out about this Gen X compound and wrote a, a newspaper article about it in the Wilmington Star News. When the public found out about this Gen X in their water, they got pretty upset. They asked, why are we drinking this compound in our water? Why don't we know anything about it? What is it doing to our bodies? What is it doing to the bodies of our children? So all of the work with this Gen X compound led to a huge amount of, of disappointment in the community in and around Wilmington that they weren't being protected from these compounds in their water. Part of the problem is that we don't really know a lot about some of these compounds. So I've studied Gen X in my lab. Other people are starting to study Gen X. But really, all these other compounds, because remember, I mentioned these are unregulated. These are emerging. We don't have a lot of information about them. So it's challenging to come up with ways to regulate them. So if we, if we look at the next slide, you can see that there were protests. Oh, it's time for questions. So we can talk a little bit about the protests in a minute. Sounds good. Yeah, let's, um, before we get into that element of kind of the uprising in the community, I mm -hmm. wanna go to your community since those are interactive sites that we have connected. We're gonna start off with our friends at The Spot. Um, and we're going to see if they have any questions for Dr. DeWitt. Now, remember, everyone, your questions can be all about her background, where she grew up, her story that she told about dissecting ticks and putting <laughs> together skeletons. Um, so think about those questions you would like to ask of Dr. DeWitt, maybe more about toxicology and what she does in the lab. So we're going to go over to our friends at the spot right now. And for those of you who are watching, we just want to remind you that you can ask questions as well. Just submit those questions on YouTube using the chat feature and on stemexplore.org by clicking submit questions. So let's head over to our friends at the spot with Miss Bailey. It looks like we have a question ready. Hello, my name is Janine and I want to ask how can we help prevent putting toxins in our water? How can we prevent putting toxins in our water? Okay, that's a really good question. So remember how I talked about I was putting lotion on my body and that gets drained off into the water and sometimes when you drink coffee that caffeine goes into the water and then I also talked about medications. So one of the best things you can do is make sure that if you have a medication that is expired you don't flush it down the toilet. You either put it in the garbage or turn it into operation medicine chest. But you can also do some things to maybe influence what your guardians purchase in terms of cleaning products. So at my home, I make all of my own cleaning products. I make most of them with vinegar and baking soda and Castile soap. So I don't buy a lot of those products that have all sorts of chemicals in them. I buy my, I buy my own and make my own. So it's a little more affordable and it puts fewer chemicals into the environment. Excellent question. question. <laughs> Do we have another question at the spot? Oh, yours. <coughs> Stand up. 
Was it was the what? most important thing to know about our water? Mm -hmm. Well, yes. You need to drink water to survive, right? So you and you want your water to be safe for you, right? Yes. So the most important thing to know is where your water comes from. Do you know where your water comes from when you run your tap? Yes. Where? Do you know? Does it come from a river? Does it come from a well? So I think those are important questions to know and you can find out. So ask your guardians, do we get our water from a well or are we part of the public water system? A lot of people in parts of North Carolina are on wells. You might want to ask, well, do we test our water? Is there, is there bacteria in it? Are there chemicals in it? Where can I get my water tested? A lot of public health departments can help to get that information for you. If you're on public water, a lot of our public water utilities send reports to your home, or you can look, look up those reports online, and you can find out what's in your water. What are you drinking? And they'll give you concentrations of chemicals in your water. So really, the, the two most important things to know about water is that you need to drink clean water, and you should know where your water comes from. Good question. Thank you. Very good question. Now, I know we do have a few more questions out there at the spot, but I do want to pop over to D.H. Connolly real quick to see if any of their questions can be answered. So, the spot, we're going to come back to you. So, D.H. Connolly, do we have questions? So, we were wondering whether the hurricanes in North Carolina increase the pollution in water and what type of pollution it brought? Yeah, that's a really good question. And actually some of my colleagues are studying that right now. In, in terms of some of the areas of North Carolina, we have a lot of hog farming. Hog farming is a really important industry for our state. It's one of the most economically important industries for our state. But honestly, hogs poop a lot. And so their poop gets stored in these lagoons. And when we have hurricanes, these lagoons get flooded. So one of the big contaminants after a hurricane is gonna be lots and lots of pig poop. Another issue comes from storage of coal burning. So the waste from coal burning, we know that there were some breaches of coal ash piles and some of those contaminants also were, le were released into the water after the hurricanes. And when we burn coal, there's usually a lot of heavy metals left behind. So there's heavy metal contamination. So a lot of heavy metals and a lot of bacteria from hog poop. Uh, some other people are looking at different types of pollution, but those are usually the two t main types of pollution, at least in this part of the state after a hurricane. That was an excellent question. All right, D.H. Conley, do we have another question out there? How do you know when chemical effects become detrimental to our health? Oh, that's a really, really good question. And I wish that I could give a really solid answer. So the easy answer though is if, if you're, let's say you're studying rats in a laboratory, if a rat dies, that's a pretty good indicator that what they're drinking is not healthy for them. But in the world of toxicology, we don't really want animals to die. So when we do research with animals, we look at effects that are a little more subtle. These are called sublethal effects or changes in their health that means that they're not really doing well, but not enough to kill them. And that's an area that, that we as toxicologists talk about a lot. Some people think it should be defined one way. Other people think it should be defined another way. But there are some sometimes some fairly clear cut answers. Tumors, so if, if an animal or if people develop cancer, that's an indicator of, of a chemical having a, what we call an adverse health effect. If there are specific diseases, like I mentioned, decreasing the ability of the immune system to do what it's supposed to do. If babies are born with abnormalities or if they're born of very low birth weight, that's an indicator that chemicals are having an effect. Uh, sometimes livers can, 
can produce enzymes that indicate that the livers are sick. So it really depends on what organ you're looking at. We have a whole suite of, of health indicators, um, but really death and cancer are two of the really most obvious endpoints. Excellent. Does that sort of answer your question? Yes, thank you. That was a complicated question, but a good one. <laughs> Perfect. So thank you, D.H. Conley. We're going to come back to you again. But Dr. DeWitt, I do want you to kind of wrap up and let's go back to that conversation about the community right there in North Carolina and what happened with uh, when people found out that Gen X was in their water. Right. Like I mentioned, after Vaughn Haggerty wrote this newspaper article that was published in the Wilmington Star News, people got really, really upset. And you can see there are a lot of protests and there still are a lot of protests. And, and a lot of this comes from the fact that people were drinking water that they assumed was safe. And then they were, were told or found out that they were drinking water that had chemicals in it about which, about which we know very little. So I don't really wanna say that the water was absolutely unsafe because we don't know that, but I also don't wanna say that the water was safe because we don't know that as well. We're trying to figure out what happens when people drink Gen X in their water. And we're trying to figure out what happens when people drink water that has other types of PFASs in it. Some people from North Carolina State University have received some funding to look at Gen X in people. And they've actually gone out to Wilmington and to Fayetteville and collected blood and urine from people who were exposed to Gen X in their water to try to understand, well, if they drank it in their water, do they still have it in their bodies? So they're measuring Gen X in their blood, they're measuring Gen X in their urine. And then they also might ask some questions about whether or not people have effects on their health from drinking Gen X. So uh, kind of one of the points of this is that, unfortunately, it takes a long time for us to, to come to agreement on whether drinking something in the water leads to these adverse or sublethal health effects. It can sometimes take years before we get enough information to make a decision that leads to, for example, a new law or a new sort of regulation that keeps these compounds out of our water. It can be really frustrating to be drinking water that has these chemicals in it with no law to protect you and your right to have clean and fresh water. And, and one of the things that I found is that I went to graduate school for a long time to learn how to do science, but nobody ever taught me about how to really talk about science, or nobody really taught me how to talk to reporters about science, how to understand the politics of environmental pollution. I think that's, for me as a scientist, this has become one of my biggest challenges. So I'm really trying to learn how to communicate my science a little bit better because of Gen X and because of the number of years I've been studying these PFASs, I get contacted by a lot of reporters to talk to them about these PFAS chemicals. And sometimes I get asked really hard questions and I don't always know what to say. And sometimes I worry that I don't say things in the right way because I don't want to make people mad. I don't want to make people scared, but I also don't want to lie to them. I want to be able to be truthful and give them good information so that they can make decisions. But it's really hard to talk to reporters and to politicians. I think that's one of the biggest challenges that I'm having in my work today. And I think that's something super important too to think about is even though you're an adult and you're in your profession, you're always learning. And sometimes things arise and you have to learn a new skill set. And um, a lot of scientists, especially, well, I mean, really any professional, you need to know how to communicate the work that you're doing. And so I think that's really important to just kind of keep on learning and embrace those opportunities. So Dr. DeWitt, we're gonna head to our interactive sites one more time to see if anybody has any questions out there. So again, those of you tuning in on YouTube or on the stemexplore.org, you can submit your questions to us. But we're gonna head over to our friends at the spot to see if they have any other questions. I know that they do. Hi, my name is Matt Asia. What is your favorite part of your job? So 
really the favorite part of my job is doing the science in the lab. Those videos that I showed you, I got to be in the lab all day on Friday and all day on Monday, and I love it. That's what I train to do. But as a college professor, most of the time I, I spend in front of the computer writing research proposals, writing papers that other scientists are going to read. But I really, really, really love being in the lab. And I really enjoy talking to people who think they might want to become scientists or trying to figure out what they're doing. So people like you, I like to talk to, to students about what they might want to do with their future. Because I didn't really have anybody talk to me about how I was going to get through college. I didn't even know how I was going to pay for college. I just went. So it, it, it helps to talk to people who might be thinking they want to go to college but don't know how they're going to do it. So I like that part of it. Excellent. Do we have another question at the spot? I think that's all of our uh, questions. No! <laughs> That's a question. So that's all of our questions. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, The Spot. Those were awesome questions. So just hang tight. We're going to head over to D.H. Conley again to see if you have any other questions. We were wondering if um, what effect does big business have on environmental studies? That, you know, that's an interesting question. So it really depends on the bigness, on the business. There are some businesses that put a lot of money into scientific research, and so they can be very beneficial in terms of giving scientists like me funds so that we can do the research that we need to do to understand what's going on with chemical pollution. There are businesses that fund research to, to support their business. Uh, it's, it's their right to do so. I mean, anybody with, with that type of money can fund the type of research that they think is most appropriate. Uh, it, you know, what, what it really comes down to, it's not so much who's doing the science, but it's how we interpret the science. So a lot of big businesses fund studies that are very well done and they follow all the rules, they have really big sample sizes, they do tons of different tests. But what's important is that we as scientists look at the results and reach our own conclusions rather than relying on the conclusions of the people who conducted the study. I would want somebody to do that to my science as well because I'm going to have a certain opinion about my science. Is it the correct opinion based on the data? I'd like to think so, but somebody else might have a difference of opinion. And that's what's cool about science. Two people can look at the same paper and reach different conclusions. The question is, what do we do to reach an agreement about those conclusions? So I guess the effect of big business really depends on how you look at those results and what you make of them. Excellent. D.H. Conley, do we have one last question before we wrap things up? What pharmaceutical drug is found in water? It's found in well water. Or just any water? Drinking water. Drinking water. Oh, gosh. There are lots and lots of pharmaceutical drugs in drinking water. Um, any, any of the constituents that, that we would take, so things from cough syrup, things from birth control pills, things that people take for high cholesterol, drugs that people take for mental illness, such as Prozac, drugs that people take for diabetes. So any drug that we take that is not 100% absorbed and 100% metabolized can end up, end up in our drinking water because we pee it out, it gets into the water, and currently we don't have regulations. So public water utilities are not required to clean them out. Here in Greenville, we have a really good treatment facility and they have uh, a way of cleaning the water so that a lot of these types of organic materials are cleaned out, but some of these end up in all of our drinking water. Wow. 
Those were fabulous questions. Thank you so much to our interactive sites at DH Conley and to The Spot, both in North Carolina. I also want to thank everyone for tuning in today. And of course, a big thank you to you, Dr. Jamie DeWitt, for joining us today. You can, of course, follow along with Dr. DeWitt and all of her adventures. You can um, access her websites, which are listed here, or you can follow her on her social media channels at Toxicology Chick. So we would like to give a big thank you to all the STEM Explore partner sites across the United States and the classrooms that have tuned in live today, especially our interactive sites at DH Conley in Greenville, North Carolina, as well as the spot in Wilson, North Carolina. Thank you both so much. And again, both of those interactive sites are partners with our friends at Love a Sea Turtle. So great questions, everyone. So Earth Echo has some pretty exciting events coming up and opportunities. Now, believe it or not, you can actually monitor the water in your community by joining the Earth Echo Water Challenge. Now, you can visit monitorwater.org monitorwater where you can learn about water quality and how to order an Earth Echo International Water Quality Testing Kit. Now, I will warn all of you out there, this is not going to test for Gen X or Prozac or bacteria in your water systems, but it will give you kind of the general basis for the quality of the water in your community. Now, I know Dr. DeWitt has used our testing kits. I know the folks at DH Conley and The Spot have also used our testing kits as well. So you can learn more about the monitor, uh, the water quality challenge at monitorwater.org. And you can become a citizen scientist and even submit your data right there and get results right there online. Now also, Expedition Water by Design is another program that we have that explores the issues of water scarcity and drought through free innovative resources. Now you and your classroom can enter to win a $500 mini grant by submitting your stories of students exploring engineering design around water resource management or developing their own water conservation or restoration project. So for more information, just simply visit earthecho.org and you can learn all about our mini grant contest. Be sure to tune in to upcoming virtual field trips as well here at Earth Echo. STEM Explore will continue to bring relatable voices in STEM careers on November 29th with two more events at 3 p.m. Eastern and 6.30 p.m. Eastern. We're excited, excited to speak with Violeta Anaya Zamora, a biologist in Mexico, and with Shavanti Archer, an engineer right here in Florida, where I am located. For more information and to register for these exciting virtual field trips, simply visit stemexplore.org, click on the live events cabinet, or the virtual field trip tabs on the left. Again, you can follow along with Earth Echo International's adventures and all our exciting programs on our social media channels, as well as our websites. And I want to say a huge thank you again to our wonderful STEM Explore mentor, Dr. Jamie DeWitt, as well as our sponsor, United Technologies, for their tremendous support. So on behalf of Earth Echo International, thank you again for joining us. And if you are celebrating Thanksgiving this week, we hope that you have much to be thankful for. So keep exploring, everyone. This is Earth Echo International signing off.